Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial. Today we're going to be looking at the anatomy of a wrist in the wrist MRI. Now this is a talk that follows on from our wrist radiograph talk. So if you haven't looked at that talk, I'd highly recommend starting there, then moving on to the 3D anatomy of the wrist as we're going to be looking at today. Now a lot of people find wrist MRI anatomy extremely difficult because there's a lot of structures passing through a very small space. Now I want to approach this systematically today, start by looking at the bones, then identify the various different tendons that cross the wrist joint, and finish off by looking at the intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments of the wrist, as well as the TFCC, or the triangular fibro cartilage complex. Now for me, understanding wrist anatomy always comes back to understanding the bony anatomy of the wrist, understanding how the carpal bones interact with one another, as well as how they interact with the bones of the forearm, as well as the metacarpals of the hand. So let's start by having a look at this 3D volume rendered CT scan, and I'm going to keep coming back to this image so that we can understand the 3D anatomy before looking at our axial, coronal, and sagittal slices in our MRI. So we can see that there are two bones of the forearm that then articulate with our carpal bones of the wrist, which in turn articulate with the metacarpals of the hand. Laterally, we have our radius here, and medially our ulna. Both our ulna and our radius have styloid processes. This is our radial styloid, this is our ulna styloid. The ulna has this indentation here, known as the ulna fovea, and posteriorly, we can see our ulna groove here, where our extensor carpi ulnaris tendon runs. Our radius and our ulna articulate with one another at the distal radial ulna joint, and the groove in the radius here that we can see here is what's known as our sigmoid notch. Our radius itself, I've mentioned, has a radial styloid. It also has this bony outcropping here known as our Lister's tubercle, which is going to become really important when we look at the tendons of the wrist. The radius then articulates with two carpal bones, our scaphoid bone and our lunate bone. This is our radioscaphoid joint and our radiolunate joint. This whole joint here is called our radiocarpal joint. We can see the scaphoid runs from posterior to anterior as we go from proximal to distal. We have a distal pole of the scaphoid, a waist of the scaphoid, and then a proximal pole. Our lunate cups the capitate, the large bone in the middle of the wrist, and our lunate articulates with our triquetrum here out medially. In front of the triquetrum, here's our triquetrum, we see a sesamoid bone here, which is our pisiform bone. So the proximal row of the carpal bones here is made up of our scaphoid, our lunate, our triquetrum, and our pisiform bone. See how the scaphoid comes out anteriorly? There's a small bony point of our scaphoid here known as the tubercle of the scaphoid. And our pisiform also lies anteriorly. So those two structures are much more anterior than the body of the scaphoid, lunate, and triquetral bones. Our distal row is made up of our hamate. We can see this outcropping here coming anteriorly is the hook of the hamate. The hamate lies next to our capitate here, which is cupped by that lunate. It's easy to see posteriorly here. Here is our capitate, our hamate running medially here. Then we have two bones sitting underneath the thumb, trapped underneath the thumb. Our trapezoid and our trapezium, which lies under the thumb. Here's our trapezium and posteriorly there, our trapezoid bone. Again, our trapezium has this anterior bony outcropping here, known as the tubercle of the trapezium. So there are four structures that lie anteriorly here on the volar surface, our tubercle of our scaphoid, our tubercle of our trapezium, our hook of our hamate, and our pisiform bone. They lie anteriorly, making this shallowed out divot on the volar surface of our wrist, which allows our flexor tendons to run through the wrist. And we have a sheet of fibrous tissue coming across the front here, known as our flexor retinaculum. And it's that space there, which is our carpal tunnel, which we're going to be looking at later. So let's have a look at these bones on an MRI. I'm going to start by showing you the coronal images, the best way to see all of the carpal bones in one. So here's our radius, our styloid process of the radius. We've got two scalloped surfaces of our radius here, our scaphoid fossa and our lunate fossa of our radiocarpal joint here. Here's our distal radio ulna joint. We've got our ulna with our ulna styloid here and the fovea of the ulna there. Here's our scaphoid bone running from posterior to anterior. Our lunate bone, which is cupping the capitate bone. We've got our triquetral bone here, 
and anterior to that triquetrum is our pisiform bone which lies in our flexor carpi ulnaris tendon that we're going to look at later. The distal row we have our bones that lie underneath the thumb, our trapezium, more posteriorly our trapezoid which lies next to our capitate bone and then our medially our hamate bone and as we head anteriorly here we can see the hook of the hamate. So you can see in this view, here are our four anterior structures, our pisiform, our hook of our hamate, our trapezium with the trapezium tubercle here, and the tubercle of the scaphoid. Here are all our flexor tendons running through that carpal tunnel. Here's our base of our first, second, third, fourth, and fifth metacarpals. So this is our carpal metacarpal joint here. So let's move on to our tendons that cross the wrist joint. The best way to look at the tendons is to look at it in the axial view so we can cut the tendons perpendicular to their course. I find it easiest to scroll all the way down to the radius and the ulna so we know exactly where we are. Here is lateral. This is our posterior surface. These are our extensor tendons and our abductor tendons. Here is the volar surface. These are all our flexor tendons of the wrist. Here's our ulna and our radius, and I want to head out slowly towards the carpal bones until we can start seeing the carpal bones come into view. Then head back into that radius, and this is the best view to look at the various different tendons across the wrist. Now our extensor tendons, or our dorsal tendons of the wrist, are separated into six separate compartments. We've got our first compartment, second compartment, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth compartments. Now each compartment contains specific tendons and I want to take you through those various different tendons. On the most lateral surface here, we have our abductor pollicis longus. It makes sense that the most lateral tendon will abduct our thumb. That's our abductor pollicis longus. Conveniently, the tendons as we go around here alternate between longus brevis, longus brevis, longus brevis tendons. So it's much easier to remember the way in which these tendons come round. So in our first compartment, we've got our abductor pollicis longus, and we've got another tendon here, which is our extensor pollicis brevis, a longus and a brevis, extensor pollicis brevis. We then have two tendons, which are our extensor carpi radialis tendons, both longus and brevis. Extensor carpi radialis makes up the second component of our dorsal tendons of the wrist. Then we have this tubercle here, which we looked at earlier, which is called Lister's tubercle, which separates our third compartment from our second compartment of the wrist. Now, there's only one tendon in our third compartment, and that's our extensor pollicis longus tendon. So we had our extensor pollicis brevis tendon here in compartment one. Extensor pollicis longus tendon here lies medial to Lister's tubercle. Now we can follow that extensor pollicis longus tendon into the hand and we see how it crosses over our second compartment here. Both our extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus tendons. And it's where that tendon crosses over, this extensor pollicis longus tendon crosses over compartment two, that we can get irritation and inflammation there, which is known as intersection syndrome. So this is an important area clinically. Then we can move on to our fourth compartment. These are our extensor digitorum tendons, both our extensor digitorum indicus, the extensor digitorum tendons that head to all four digits here. Laterally to that is a single tendon, it's quite difficult to see, here it is here, is our extensor digiti minimi, which makes up our fifth compartment of the dorsal tendons of the wrist. The last compartment also only has one tendon, that's here, our sixth compartment, which is our extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. Now extensor carpi ulnaris tendon runs in this ulnar groove here, and it actually makes up that posterior surface of our triangular fibro cartilage complex, which we're going to look at later. So those are our six compartments of our dorsal tendons. On the volar surface, it's much easier to remember. We can see these tendons running on the volar surface heading into the wrist. And we know that many of these tendons run through our carpal tunnel. Now earlier I showed you various different anterior structures of the wrist that made up the carpal tunnel. Here we can see our tubercle of our trapezium as well as our hook of our hamate. And we've got this fibrous tissue running between those anterior structures. This is our flexor retinaculum which makes up our carpal tunnel here.
So there are nine tendons that run through the carpal tunnel. We can have a look at them now. We've got our flexor digitorum tendons, both our flexor digitorum profundus and our flexor digitorum superficialis tendons. If we actually head out into the forearm a little bit, we can see those tendons, our flexor digitorum superficialis and our flexor digitorum profundus tendons. Then we have one more tendon. So there's four profundus tendons, four superficialis tendons, and our ninth tendon is our flexor pollicis longus tendon. So let's follow those into our carpal tunnel, and we can see how there's not much space here. The other structure that you'll see here is our median nerve running within that carpal tunnel. You can see how if there's inflammation here or swelling, how we can get impingement of that median nerve giving us carpal tunnel syndrome. And surgeons may need to cut this flexor rectus inoculum to make more space there. Now there are two other flexor tendons of the wrist that don't actually go through the carpal tunnel. The first is our flexor carpi radialis tendon that actually heads into the flexor rectus inoculum. You see how it runs within the flexor rectus inoculum here. It heads out underneath the tubercle of our trapezium and goes all the way into the hand and actually inserts onto the base of the second metacarpal bone here. You can see it here inserting onto the base there, running underneath that tubercle of the trapezium and into the forearm here. Now the last tendon here is our flexor carpi ulnaris tendon, which heads out towards our pisiform bone and actually encapsulates that pisiform bone. That pisiform is a sesamoid bone. And that then has a ligament to the hamate bone and to the base of the fifth metacarpal bones. So we've seen our median nerve here. We can see another nerve on the medial surface here, which is our ulnar nerve. We can see our ulnar nerve here running with our ulnar artery running within this canal. And this is known as Guyon's canal. We can also see if we head out into the forearm again, we can see our radial artery and our radial nerve here. Our radial artery as we head into the hand will then extend posteriorly to the dorsal surface of the hand. So those are the major tendons that I want to discuss. Now we're going to move on to the ligaments of the wrist. Now many people find the ligaments extremely difficult to understand and I want to show you where those ligaments run on this 3D rendered CT first and then we're going to head into the MRI. Now a lot of these ligaments are quite difficult to see on an MRI and the MRI I've got here is quite thick slice and we're going to miss some of these ligaments but I want you to understand where they run. And the ligaments really are structurally important in maintaining the integrity of the wrist, maintaining the 3D relationship of the carpal bones to one another. Now we can separate the ligaments of the wrist into intrinsic ligaments and extrinsic ligaments. Intrinsic ligaments connect carpal bones to carpal bones. Extrinsic ligaments are basically thickenings of the joint capsule and they connect our bones of our forearm, our radius and our ulna to the bones of the wrist, the carpal bones. So let's start by looking at the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist and there are only three ligaments that I want to draw your attention to here. We can see our scaphoid, our lunate and our triquetrum bone here making up the proximal row of the wrist as well as this pisiform bone. Now there are strong ligaments between our scaphoid and our lunate, known as our scapholunate ligament, and between our lunate and our triquetrum, our lunotriquetral ligaments. Now this ligament runs from the dorsal surface here underneath and wraps around to the volar surface here. And there are actually three components of that ligament as it wraps around. We've got a volar component, an interosseous or membranous component at the proximal surface, and then we've got a dorsal component. Now the dorsal component of our scapholunate ligament is perhaps most functionally important of that, and as it heads round, it starts thicker posteriorly, and as it heads round volarly or anteriorly, it becomes thinner, that ligament. The opposite is true for our lunotriquetral ligament, which starts out thick on the volar surface, gets thinner through the intraosseous or membranous surface, and then becomes quite thin on our dorsal surface here. Those are the two main intrinsic ligaments. We also have our scapho-trapezo-trapezoid ligaments, and that forms an STT joint, a scapho-trapezo-trapezoid joint here, which we'll also look at. So let's have a look at those intrinsic ligaments on our MRI scan. Now, on the proximal surface of these, I said there's a membranous or a intraosseous surface of that ligament. It's not actually a true ligament, it's actually fibrocartilage heading out on these proximal surfaces here. So we can see our scaphoid bone, our lunate bone, and we can see that intraosseous or membranous portion of our scapholunate ligament here. 
And as we head out to our lunar triquetral ligament, we can actually see our intraosseous or membranous portion here can take many different shapes. We can have a broad triangular shape, we can have a linear shape, and actually function is not so important when we're looking at this intramembranous section. Now if we want to see our dorsal and our volar ligaments here, it's best to look at it on an axial slice. We might catch some of those ligaments here, we can see running from our scaphoid to our lunate, and on the volar surface it's a bit more difficult. But here's our volar scapholunate ligament. So our dorsal scapholunar ligament and our volar scapholunate ligament. Let's look at those on the axial slices, it's much easier to find. Now most important when looking at the axial slices is realizing where you are. Are you in the proximal row or are you in the distal row of our carpal bones? And again, the easiest way to do that, head out into the forearm, scroll up slowly until you see those carpal bones come into view. You know the first carpal bone here is our lunate and our scaphoid bone laterally here and heading out to our triquetrum here. You can see how the lunate cups that capitate here, our capitate coming into view there. So dorsally, the strongest part of our scapholunate ligament is this dorsal portion here. We can see it's thickened. This is our dorsal scapholunate ligament. Anteriorly, we can see also there's the anterior scapholunate ligament. Let's look at our lunotriquetral ligament. Dorsally, it's very thin. Anteriorly, we've got this thick band here, the volar lunotriquetral ligament. Then I said we've got our STT joint, so let's find our scaphoid bone. Sometimes it's easier to find the lunate, this crescent-shaped bone cupping the capitate, and then head out towards our scaphoid bone, which we know goes from posterior to anterior. And here is our STT joint, our scapho-trapezo-trapezoid or joint there. And there are ligaments that attach these intrinsic ligaments, which I'm not going to show you on this MRI. Now let's have a look at the extrinsic ligaments of the wrist. The extrinsic ligaments attach the radius and the ulna to the carpal bones. They're both volar extrinsic ligaments and dorsal extrinsic ligaments. Let's start by looking at the volar extrinsic ligaments because we are on the volar surface here. Now we've got a ligament that comes from this lateral surface of the radius, goes over the waist of the scaphoid and attaches to the capitate here. This is our radioscaphocapitate ligament. Then we have a ligament slightly more medially running from the radius to the lunate and to the triquetrum here. This is our radiotriquetral ligament, also known as our long radiolunate ligament. Now our long radiolunate ligaments coming from the radius to the lunate and to the triquetrum. We have a short radiolunate ligament here coming from the radius to the lunate. So we've got a long radiolunate ligament going from radius to lunate to triquetrum and a short radiolunate ligament going from radius to lunate. Then we've got ulnar-sided ligaments, which are also extrinsic volar ligaments. It's our ulnar triquetral ligament, our ulnar capitate ligament, and our ulnar lunate ligament. And those three ligaments also become really important to make the anterior surface of that triangular fibrocartilage complex, which we're going to look at next. So we've got these volar extrinsic ligaments. Let's go have a look at them on our MRI. These can be quite difficult to see, especially on this coronal plane. But let's go and find the volar surface of the wrist. Now many people struggle to figure out whether they're lying dorsally or on the volar surface when they're looking at the coronal images. And the way you want to do it is find those four anterior structures. Find the trapezium, the scaphoid, the hook of our hamate, and our pisiform bone. These are our flexor tendons. We know we're on the volar surface. Then scroll posteriorly or dorsally until you can see your radius come into view. Now we can see these fibers running across here, a little bit difficult to see, from our radius to our lunate and then heading out to our triquetrum. These fibers here are our long radiolunate or our radiotriquetral ligament. We can then also see these short radiolunate fibers running here. We also have our radioscaphocapitate ligament. We can see it coming from the most lateral surface of our radius here by our radial styloid, running around the waist of our scaphoid here, then coming out to the anterior or volar surface of our wrist and attaching to the capitate here. You can see it wrapping around that bone. Quite difficult to see in the coronal plane. Then let's go on to our ulnar extrinsic volar ligament. We've got our 
ulnar triquetral ligament running from the ulnar styloid here to the triquetrum, quite difficult to see. We'll have an ulnar lunate ligament that we might catch the anterior surface of here. This is potentially the ulnar lunate ligament coming from this ulnar heading across towards the lunate there on the volar surface. And we have an ulnar capitate ligament, which might be quite difficult to see on this uh, plane. Let's have a look at on the axial plane, and these ligaments all merge into one, and you can see how they're quite continuous with one another. They make up this thick band here. These are our extrinsic volar ligaments, and we can head down towards our radius, our ulna. We see our radius will give off our radiolunate, our long radiolunate heading towards the triquetrum here. Our ulna will give us our ulna triquetral ligament. You can see it just coming off the ulnar surface here to the triquetrum, as well as our ulnar lunate ligament, all fusing to form this thick band, this thick ligament here. Now let's look at our extrinsic dorsal ligaments of the wrist. We have our volar surface of this 3D rendered diagram. Let's go to the dorsal surface. Now there are actually only three ligaments that I want to look at on this dorsal surface. We've got a ligament that attaches our radius to our ulna, that's our dorsal radio ulna ligament. And actually what I failed to mention on the front side here was our volar radial ulna ligament, which I'll show you when we look at our TFCC complex. So we've got a dorsal radio ulna ligament. Then we have a ligament coming from our radius to our triquetrum, that's our dorsal radio triquetral ligament. And then we've got a ligament that extends along the posterior surface of this wrist, which is known as our dorsal intercarpal ligament. It heads from the triquetrum to the scaphoid, as well as extending branches towards the trapezium and the trapezoid bones. So let's look at those on our MRI. I'll start by having a look at the coronal section. Again, if we scroll anteriorly, we see those four anterior structures. We want to scroll in the opposite direction, get to the posterior surface here. And actually, we can see very nicely coming into view here is our dorsal radio triquetral ligament running from the radius to the posterior surface of the triquetrum here. Then we can see these fibers running across from this posterior surface of the triquetrum heading towards our scaphoid bone here. This is our dorsal intercarpal ligament here and we can with an eye of faith see some ligaments going towards our trapezium and our tra trapezoid. As we head more posteriorly we can see there's a ligament running from the radius to the ulnar styloid coming across here. This is our dorsal radio ulnar ligament. We can also see our volar radio ulnar ligament here perhaps coming from the radius to the ulna. Now those make up the posterior surface, our dorsal radio ulnar ligament, the posterior surface of our TFCC, our triangular fiber cartilage complex, which we're going to look at next, as well as the anterior surface, which is made up by the volar radio ulnar ligament. So let's go ahead and look at that TFCC, the triangular fiber cartilage complex of the wrist. And the TFCC lies above the ulna here, and what it does is it provides stability to the wrist, as well as transferring weight, axial loading through the wrist, away from the ulna into this broader based radius here, allows the weight to go through here. Now the TFCC is also like a meniscus within the knee, it provides some cushioning between the carpal bones and the ulna itself. So let's look at these structures. We've already looked at the anterior surface, which is this volar radio ulnar ligament, and we've looked at the posterior surface, which is this dorsal radio ulnar ligament. More posteriorly, we've got our extensor carpi ulnaris tendon here, and that sheath of this tendon, as we follow it across here, provides some posterior surface of this TFCC. Anteriorly, we looked at those volar extrinsic ligaments of the wrist, our ulna triquetral, ulna capitate, and ulna lunate, those also provide anterior wall of this TFCC complex. Within the complex itself, we have this triangular fiber cartilage disc proper here, which is this biconcave shaped structure, which is hypo-intense to the surrounding structures. You can see it attaches to the radius itself onto the cartilage. We've got a hyper-intense relative to the disc itself structure running along here. This is the cartilage. This is not a tear of the TFCC disc proper. This is the radial attachment. And then we've got medial attachments which attach to the ulna itself. We've got both a 
foveal attachment. So let's go to the ulnar fovea here. Quite difficult to see on this image, but we've got this extending down to the fovea. There's no cartilage here. There should be a strong connection between the triangular fibrocartilage ligament and the fovea. And quite difficult to see on this image, but we have a ligament heading towards our styloid process as well coming across here. So this triangular fibrocartilage disc gives off two triangular fibrocartilage ligaments, one heading to the fovea and one heading to the styloid process, which unfortunately we can't see too well here. Above that triangular fibrocartilage disc proper is this fibrocartilaginous structure here known as our ulnar meniscal humilog. That ulnar meniscal humilog is a fibrocartilage tissue running superiorly to this TFC disc proper and it fuses with this ulnar collateral ligament which is basically a thickening of the synovial capsule here. So the triangular fibrocartilage disc is a really important point to look at when assessing the MRI because we can get degenerative or traumatic changes within this disc. Now many people find this TFCC complex quite difficult to conceptualize and I like to think of it as different borders housing around this disc as well as the triangular fibrocartilage ligaments and the ulnar menisco humilog. So our lateral border here is our ulnar collateral ligament, our medial border is the attachment of the disc to the radius here and our posterior surface is made up of that extensor carpi ulnaris tendon sheath as well as our dorsal radio ulnar joint and the anterior surface is made up of that volar radio ulnar joint as well as those extrinsic ligaments coming off the ulna towards the carpal bones, our ulna triquetral, ulna capitate and ulna lunate ligaments. Now I know we've gone through a lot here and there's lots of anatomy running through a very small space. But again, if you approach the wrist systematically, you start by having a look at the bones, understanding where they are in relationship to one another, then look at the tendons, the six different dorsal compartments, looking at the volar tendons, our flexor tendons, running through our carpal tunnel, as well as our flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi radialis tendons. Then you can move on to the ligaments, our intrinsic ligaments, connecting carpal bones to one another, our scapholunate ligament, our lunotriquetral ligament, our scaphotrapezotrapezoidal ligament, and then look at our extrinsic ligaments, our volar surface ligaments, our radio capitate, our radio scapho capitate, our long radio lunate, our short radio lunate, as well as our ulna triquetral, ulna capitate, and ulna lunate ligaments, as well as our volar radio ulna ligament. Then move on to the dorsal surface, no, our radio triquetral, our dorsal intercarpal ligaments, as well as our dorsal radio ulna ligament. Go through those systematically. Every time you go through an MRI, try and identify these structures, and then you'll start gaining a better appreciation for where you are in the wrist and which structures you are looking at. If you've made it to the end of this video, well done. It's a lot of content to go through. I really do hope you find these talks helpful. If you do, I would appreciate it if you consider liking this video, as well as subscribing to the channel for more anatomy and physics videos. And until next time, I'll see you all. Goodbye.